Okay, so this is the fifth lecture. So we're a little bit more than halfway through the course, because remember, we're only going to be meeting for eight weeks. And basically, so far, what we've done is week one, we talked about what are some general problems that exist in the world of viral epidemiology. And then week two, we talked about how do I sequence an unknown virus and then assemble its genome sequence. Uh, and then week three, we talked about how do I actually make sense of that genome sequence? How do I actually, um, you know, annotate it? How do I, you know, overlay some information that's helpful? Uh, right. And then week four, uh, basically, we talked about, okay, now that I have a reference genome available, now that I have this high quality gold standard genome, how do I sequence future viral genomes? So I don't have to go through the same intense labor as I did with the very first one where I was kind of sequencing it blind. Uh, with the future ones, we talked about this approach where I can basically map the reads to this genome that I've already assembled. And even though I expect that they're going to deviate, uh, it, should, it should still look fairly similar. So basically, we ended last week by saying, now I have a super fast and super accurate way of given a bunch of samples uh, of either COVID patients or whatever uh, virus that you're looking at. I can sequence their genomes, and now I have a complete genome sequence from the virus that was collected from each of these people. Uh, so now what we're going to focus on is what do I actually do with that? How do I use this to do some type of real world analysis? Uh, and the first thing that we're going to talk about is how we can do some type of comparisons between the viral sequences that I've obtained. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about is this problem known as sequence alignment. So before I get started, any questions, any concerns? OK. So here's the outline for today. I'm going to talk about what are some types of mutations. So this is kind of a review of intro bio. Uh, and we're going to talk about how mutate, uh, how like sequences mutate along an evolutionary tree, along a phylogeny. And then I'm going to introduce two computational problems. I'm going to introduce the problem known as pairwise sequence alignment, as well as the problem known as multiple sequence alignment. And then I'm going to end by discussing a technique that we can use to speed up this computationally intensive multiple sequence alignment. Uh, but first, let's just kind of review some of the background information. Let's talk about what are some types of mutations. So in general, in viruses, there's a few common types of mutations. Uh, one of them is a substitution. So a substitution is when one nucleotide is replaced with a different nucleotide. So in this case, my original sequence was ACT, and then it evolved, it mutated into ACG. So this T mutated into a G. We also have insertions, uh, which are when one or more nucleotides are added. So if my original sequence was ACT, maybe I inserted this G to make it ACGT. So a new, uh, a new nucleotide was inserted into my original sequence. Similarly, on the flip side, we could have deletions, which are when one or more nucleotides are deleted from my original sequence. So if my original sequence was like ACGT, maybe this G got deleted and the resulting sequence was ACT. And I want to emphasize that all of these types of mutations that I described are heritable mutations. So these mutations are inherited, they're passed down to the descendants. Okay, any questions about that? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, and in general, feel free to unmute, feel free to, you know, raise your hand, all that good stuff. Cool. Okay, so now that we've reviewed what are some types of mutations, let's talk about how these mutations actually happen along an evolutionary tree, along a phylogeny. So imagine that I have this evolutionary tree, right, this phylogeny, and I have some ancestral sequence. So let's say that the common ancestor of all of these four present day uh, species, the genome was ACGT. So we can think of mutations as kind of happening along branches of the evolutionary tree. Because remember, evolution forward in time is down. It's away from the root. So as we go down the tree, mutations can occur along the branches. So for example, Maybe along this branch over here, 
this G in the third position had a substitution and it mutated into a C. So now at any point, starting from where that mutation happened, all the way down the tree, that mutation is inherited, right? So all of the descendants, so like these two, are going to inherit this mutation that happened. And then maybe along this other branch, because these are two separate independent evolutionary histories, right? Once this branching happens, the left side and the right side are two independent evolutionary histories. So maybe this G actually got deleted in this sequence. So now everything from here downward has ACT because that G got deleted. I'm putting a gap to denote that like, hey, a letter got deleted here. And now let's imagine that like along this branch over here, no additional mutations happen. So the sequence that we're able to observe in present day is ACCT. It's the ancestral sequence that then got mutated here and then didn't mutate ever again. Versus maybe this sequence, let's imagine that another mutation happens along this branch where the A in the first position turns into a C. The sequence of this present day species, it's going to be the ancestry sequence, but then the G in the third position mutated into a C, and the A in the first position mutated into a C as well, so we get CCCT. And then let's say here, no additional mutations happened here. And then same thing here, let's say one mutation happened along this branch where the G, uh, sorry, the C in the second position turned into a G. So this is going to be the example that we're going to be working with. Okay, any questions about that? Does that kind of make sense so far? So basically, mutations happen along branches as we go forward in time. And then once a mutation happens, it gets passed down all the way to all the descendants. Okay. So remember, though, that with, um, with viruses, we don't get to observe this evolutionary history, right? We can't see it. So all that we're able to observe are these present day sequences. And the computational problem that we want to try to approach is how do I predict what the evolutionary history was when I'm only given the present day sequences? And what's even worse is that notice that in these present day sequences I'm showing you, we actually have information about where these deletions occurred. But remember, a deletion is just something gets deleted. So in reality, these deletions actually don't get observed, right? Because the deletion is just a letter got deleted. So if it got deleted, I just no longer have any, any evidence of it. It got deleted. So it turns out that to be able to infer the evolutionary history, I need to be able to first predict where any of these deletions or insertions might have happened. Um, so I basically, the first task before I can go from these raw genome sequences that we've collected back to the evolutionary history is I have to figure out where I can put these little dashes to line the sequences up correctly, because I want uh, letters that correspond to the exact same position in the original ancestor to all be lined up together. And I'm going to explain why that is next week when we actually talk about inferring the evolutionary traits. But for today, our problem is just Given all of these sequences, how do I predict where those dashes are supposed to go? OK, so is the computational problem clear? Any questions about that? Basically, given a bunch of present day sequences, I want to figure out where I should stick in the gaps to make them line up properly. Make sense? OK. So the computational problem that we're going to introduce is what's called pairwise sequence alignment. And this is what we do to try to figure out where those spaces should be. So pairwise sequence alignment, the computational problem is basically my input is two sequences, X and Y. So in this example, X is the sequence ACT, Y is the sequence ACGT. And my output is a highest scoring alignment between X and Y. And by alignment, I mean, basically, I keep all the letters of X, I keep all the letters of Y, but I'm allowed to stick in these dash characters wherever I want in either sequence, such that 
after adding the dash characters, they're the exact same length. And I never have a dash across from a dash. So these dashes can only go across from actual letters. OK, so is, is the concept of what an alignment is making sense? Basically, stick in dashes into either sequence to get them to be the same length. Uh, so someone asked, can I please explain that again? Yeah, so, so basically, my input is just these two sequences right here. And what I want to figure out is where do I put these dashes in either sequence such that I maximize a score? So here, now you'll notice, so originally, these two sequences don't really seem to line up very well, right? Like this T is across from a G, and then this T is not across from anything. But if I just stick this little space character here, now they line up pretty nicely. Uh, there's a question, how do we know what's the beginning and what's the end? Uh, so these genome sequences, these are the genomes of the virus that we've assembled. So going back to like the week two topic, remember we had the raw reads and then we assembled them into a genome sequence from start to end. So these are those genome sequences. And the beginning and the end of each of them is the beginning and end of that genome sequence. Does that kind of make sense? Am I, am I understanding your question correctly? Yeah, all right, cool. Okay, so yeah, basically input is these two sequences and these are gonna be viral genomes. And then the output is somehow lining them up so that we maximize some score. So I keep saying we maximize a score. What is that score? I have to define a scoring function. So we're gonna define a scoring function where basically given an alignment, we're going to define the score of one column of that alignment. Um, we're going to define it using this match, mismatch, or gap score. So basically, if the two letters in a given column of our alignment are the same, we give it a plus one. In this case, I just arbitrarily picked plus one as my match score. If there's two sequences, uh, if there's two letters, but they're different, we're going to give it this mismatch penalty, which I've just arbitrarily picked negative one. And if either of the two letters is a gap, is you know that dash character, we're going to give it this gap penalty, which is negative one. And the score of the overall alignment is just the sum of the scores of the individual columns. And I want to work on an example just to kind of hit that home. So imagine these are our two input sequences. And let's pretend that this is one hypothetical alignment that we want to be able to score. So it's a valid alignment, right? The two sequences are now the exact same length. And dashes are only across from letters. We never have dashes across from dashes. So this is a valid alignment. It's a valid pairwise alignment, right? It's a valid alignment between this pair of sequences. So now I want to score this alignment that I have here. So what I do is I go column by column by column by column, and I use this scoring definition that I've come up with to score each of the columns. And then the overall score is going to be the sum of all of those individual columns. So the first column, I have an A across from an A. So that's the match score, right? I have the two letters are matching. So I add plus one to my score. In the second position, in the second column, I have a gap character, right? This dash across from a letter. So I give it the gap penalty. So minus one. And then in the third column, I have a mismatch, right? I have two letters, but these are two different letters. I have a C in one of the sequences and a G in the other sequence. So mismatch penalty, I give it minus one. And then in the last column, I have a T across from a T. So this is a match. I have the same letter in both sequences in this column. So I give it a match, which is plus one. Right. So then the overall score of this pairwise alignment is zero. It was plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, which overall becomes zero.
Okay, so does that scoring method kind of make sense? So if I gave you a match score, a mismatch penalty, and the gap, and I gave you a pairwise alignment to score, you would just kind of go column by column, look up if it's a match, mismatch, or a gap, and then add those up over the entire sequences. Any questions about that? Does that kind of make sense? Okay, let's work through another example. So this is that first alignment that I showed back when I introduced this. Let's try to score it. So what do I do for the first? Uh, uh, there's a question. Uh, makes sense. So are we generally expected to fix it or just score it? So right now we're only talking about how to score it, right? Because the computational problem, I said my input is going to be two sequences and my output is an alignment that maximizes some scoring function. So right now we're just describing how we can even score a given alignment. And later, I'm going to talk about how we actually find an alignment that maximizes this score. But for now, we're just talking about how do I score a given alignment? Yeah, great question. OK, so for this one, what is the first thing that we have to do? So what is going to be the score of the first column, just to make sure everyone is on the same page? What do I have to do? So I want to compute the score of this alignment. So first, I look at the first column. What is the score of the first column? It's a match, so plus one, exactly. And then the second column, just to make sure people are awake, <laughs> it's also a match, right? And then third column is a gap, so we get minus one. And then the last column is a match, which is plus one. So for this alignment, the overall score is plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, which is overall a score of two. So remember, this alignment had a score of zero. This alignment has a score of two. So this one with the score of two is the better alignment. And kind of thinking back to what we were trying to do, Intuitively, it kind of makes sense that this is the better one because the letters are lining up much better than they were in this one. Right, okay, so is it clear how, if I gave you two sequences, is it clear how you would compute the score? Uh, if I gave you a, a sequence line, I mean, if I gave you the, the pairwise alignment, is it clear how you would compute the score? Any questions about that? No questions? Cool. Okay. So now the computational problem hopefully is a little bit better formulated. Our computational problem is if my input is just these two sequences, how do I find a pairwise alignment that maximizes this score? So basically out of all possible pairwise alignments that I could make, so out of all possible places I could stick in these gap characters, which pairwise alignment gives me the highest score? That is the pairwise alignment that I want to find. And the algorithm that does this is called the needleman wunsch algorithm. So basically, the needleman wunsch algorithm finds a highest scoring pairwise alignment. And I'm not going to talk about the super, super in-depth details of the algorithm. But essentially, what we do is we construct a matrix corresponding to the two sequences. And then we basically fill in this matrix using a recurrence relation. And all of this stuff is pretty advanced algorithms. So I'm not going to go into this, the nitty gritty details. I just want to kind of give you the higher level principle. And then later on, if you ever choose to take like a bioinformatics algorithms class, then you'll go way more into the nitty gritty. Or if you want, I can send you resources. But the general idea is we build this matrix where one of the sequences represents the rows. Uh, sorry, the columns, and then the other sequence represents the rows. And then we fill in this matrix using those match, mismatch, and gap scores that we have to basically just fill in this matrix. And how I'm filling it in, don't worry about it. Just pretend that I gave you some algorithm that tells you how to fill in each individual slot. And then I take the bottom right corner. And then I backtrack these arrows to get back to the start. So again, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details because that in itself is like 
you know, an entire week of like an advanced algorithms course. But the key takeaway that I want to emphasize is that if the length of X and the length of Y are both K, so let's say K is the length of either of these sequences. So for COVID-19, a genome sequence is length 29,000, right? There's 29,000 letters in the COVID-19 genome. So in that case, K would be 29,000. Uh, what I want to, like the, the key takeaway here, and this big, oh, this is a computer science notation. Don't necessarily worry too much about what that means. But the key takeaway is that if you gave me two sequences that have length K, this algorithm scales quadratically with K. So it scales roughly K squared. I have to do roughly K squared operations. So if you double the length of the sequences, it would quadruple the runtime. It would quadruple how many operations I have to do because it would basically quadruple the number of cells in that matrix. Does that make sense? So the key takeaway is there is an algorithm that can find this maximum scoring pairwise alignment and it scales quadratically with respect to the length of the sequences. Does that kind of make sense? I threw a lot of words at you. So I want to make sure, feel free to like ask any questions, feel free to raise your hand. So there is an algorithm, it just scales quadratically with the number of sequences because we fill in this matrix, this K by K matrix. Really K plus one by K plus one, but pretty much the same. Okay. So I just talked about pairwise sequencing. So I talked about given two sequences, how do I come up with an alignment of just those two sequences? But if I'm dealing with COVID-19, I have millions of sequences, right? And I wanna figure out how do I line up these millions of sequences together in one go? And this is the problem known as multiple sequence alignment. And again, this is like a super intense topic that like takes a whole graduate course effectively. Um, so I'm just gonna give a very high level summary and I'm happy to point people in the right direction uh, if you wanna learn more. But essentially in multiple sequence alignment, so I wanna remind you from what we just learned, if we wanna align two sequences where each of the sequences is length K, that is K squared number of operations that we have to do, right? That was what I just showed you with pairwise alignment where I have to fill this K by K matrix, this K by K table. So aligning two sequences is K squared operations. It turns out that there exists a similar algorithm that I can use to align three sequences. So if you gave me three sequences instead of just two, I could use a similar algorithm to align them by filling a cube that is K by K by K. So K cubed operations, right? And the details of that algorithm, don't worry about it, but similar concept where I'm just kind of filling in a table, but now it's a three-dimensional table, it's a cube. Okay, so yeah, so, like, so aligning three sequences takes K to the third operations to perform. So it turns out that there's an even more general algorithm that if I wanna align N sequences, so if I have N equals 1 million sequences, or I think right now for COVID, we have 7 million sequences available, uh, each of them is length K, this approach is big O. So this approach scales, like I have to do K to the power of N operations. So in other words, it scales exponentially with respect to the number of sequences that I have. Um, and this slide is actually slightly out of date. Let me, let me actually update this real quick. Um, oh, is it not easy for me to update? Maybe it's not. Ah, that's okay. Uh, so N is actually over 7 million now. So with COVID-19, I mentioned people are sequencing it super, super fast, more than any other virus we've ever sequenced before. So we now have like over 7 million sequences that we have to align. Each of them is length 29,000. So the number of operations that we would have to do would be roughly 29,000 to the power of four, or actually now 7 million, which is really, 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 really big. Yeah, as, as someone mentioned in the chat, you can't imagine a worse scenario. Uh, so 
even if I imagine that every single one of those operations, so every one of those cells of that n-dimensional table that I'm trying to fill takes only one nanosecond, this would take longer than the existence of the entire universe, which if what we're doing is trying to do real-time public health intervention, runtime that's longer than the existence of the universe is obviously a little bit too slow. Um, yeah, so, so this is way, way, way too slow. And there exist what are called heuristics. So in computer science, a heuristic is an algorithm that's not guaranteed to give an optimal solution, but it hopefully will typically give a pretty good solution. Uh, so there's heuristics that exist that can give you approximate alignments. And these heuristics, they scale roughly quadratically so like they scale roughly n squared times k plus k squared times n. And in this example, k squared is fixed because it doesn't grow, right? It's just 29,000 squared. Like the length of COVID-19 genome doesn't grow. But this n term is what's growing really, really rapidly. So n squared, you know, when n is over 7 million, this actually also gets pretty big. So the tools that currently exist that do this, here's a couple that are the, the best practice tools where you give it a bunch of sequences and then it lines them up for you. And math, this top one is kind of the best practice that people have been using in the past. But for COVID-19, all of these tools are way too slow. We cannot do real time um, analysis. So for context, math is the fastest of these tools. Um, and back in the early days of the pandemic, when it looked like maybe we would be able to do this, um, I remember it was taking me like two hours to align like 100,000 sequences, uh, probably fewer, probably, uh, probably like 50,000 sequences. So now if we have 7 million, that's 100 times the number of sequences. If it scales quadratically, then if I multiply the input by 100, the runtime is going to multiply by 100 squared. Right, which is really big. So if it took me like a couple hours to do like 50,000 sequences, now it'll take a couple hours times, what, 100 times 100, like a million? No, wait, I always look at that. 10,000? <laughs> I think 10,000. Um, so either way, way too slow, like tens of thousands of hours to align. OK, so any questions so far? So we talked about what is pairwise alignment. We talked about. How do I generalize it to a bunch of sequences, which I need to do for the COVID-19 pandemic? And now we've shown this is way, 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 way too slow. So is all doomed? But first, I guess, any questions? No questions? OK. So fortunately, all is not doomed. Uh, there's ways to speed this up. And I'm going to actually talk about a tool that I built that really, really, really speeds this up. Um, so, so what I'm going to talk about now is what's called reference guided multiple sequence alignment. Um, so in the previous examples of alignment that I was telling you about, so with pairwise alignment and multiple sequence alignment, we could use those to align any arbitrary sequences, right? They could be as different from each other as we want. And those algorithms that I described can line them up, but that flexibility that ability to be able to align any arbitrary sequences, regardless of how different they might be. That is why they are so slow. But in the case of COVID-19, and generally in the case of viruses, very, very, very few mutations happen, right? Like, as far as a public health standpoint goes, it's a lot. But as far as evolution goes, right, like two SARS-CoV-2 samples are much more similar than like human and chimp. Right, so for SARS-CoV-2, even though like we get scared from all the mutations, if we compare it to the length of the entire genome, it's only like maybe 1% of the genome is different, if that. So what I'm going to talk about is a way that maybe we can somehow use that reference genome that we constructed and we used last week to help speed this up. Because we know in advance that every single viral genome that I collect is going to be almost identical to the reference genome. So this align to reference approach, here I'm showing the reference genome as this thick green line, 
And each of the genomes that I've collected from people, so maybe like these are different people on UCSD campus that did the nasal swab and then I assembled their genome. Uh, each of these is one individual person. And I wanna align these, uh, I wanna align these people to each other. So the approach that I could take is I could do a pairwise alignment of the first person to the reference genome. I could do a pairwise alignment of the second person to the reference genome. I could do a, a pairwise alignment from the third person and the fourth person, all of them directly to the reference genome. And what I wanna emphasize here is each of these pairwise alignments against the reference genome, these are completely independent, right? Like the alignment of the reference genome to this red sequence doesn't impact the alignment of this reference genome to this orange sequence in any way. These are completely independent. So I could parallelize them. I could do them all at the exact same time. And then once I've done all of those pairwise alignments to the reference genome, I can then use each position of the reference genome as an anchor to kind of combine all of the sequences together. So for example, I can look at the first position of the reference genome and I can see for each of the sequences that I have, which letter in that sequence mapped to this first position when I did its pairwise alignment. So maybe this red sequence, maybe this position here is the one that aligned with the first position of my reference genome. For this orange sequence, maybe this position here is the one that lined up with that first position. Maybe this one was here, this one is here. And then what I could do is then kind of take all those letters and merge them into being the first column of my multiple sequence alignment. Okay, so real quick, any questions about what I've said so far about this? So I align each of them pairwise to the reference genome. And then once I'm done with that, I take a position from the reference genome and I see for each of my sequences, what letter from that sequence matched with the first position of my reference genome when I did those pairwise alignments. And then I kind of just shove them together those become the column. Kind of makes sense. Yeah, super, super interesting, right? Um, and then I could do that with the second column, I could do that with the third column, I could do that with the fourth column, fifth column, all the way down until I hit every position of my reference genome. Yeah, it's a lot faster. And we're gonna actually talk about that. So, um, so I, I basically do this with every position of my reference genome. And then once I concatenate all those things to become all the columns, concatenating those columns becomes my multiple sequence alignment. So the benefit of this approach is that all of these pairwise alignments to the reference genome are done completely independently. Um, so from a computer science standpoint, this means I have massive room for parallelization. So if I have a multi-threaded machine, or even if I have like multiple compute nodes, like with the, uh, the, I don't know if anyone's seen the supercomputer center on campus. It's like, I think right behind ERC, maybe. Uh, it's like close to the Hopkins parking lot. If you're ever on campus, definitely check it out. Um, but like at the supercomputer center, there's like hundreds or maybe even like a thousand compute nodes, like individual computers. And I could theoretically distribute this across each of those to do pairwise alignments to the reference genome completely independently. And, you know, as Adia mentioned, this scales linearly as a function of the number of sequences. So just even in principle, this is much faster. So remember when I spoke about the previous multiple sequence alignment approaches, just doing the regular optimal multiple sequence alignment scaled exponentially with the number of sequences. And even those heuristics scaled quadratically as the like with the number of sequences so this scales linearly with the number of sequences if you double the number of sequences you double the amount of time it takes you don't quadruple it you don't multiply it by like some large exponent so one limitation of this however is that it's hard to handle insertions with respect to the reference genome so because i'm using each position of the reference genome as an anchor uh, basically, any letter from my sequences that maps to a position of the reference genome and any deletion, any gap that I placed in one of these sequences 
with respect to the reference genome, those are easy for me to pick apart. But if there was ever a case where there was a letter in a sequence that didn't exist in the reference genome, so I had a gap in the reference genome when I did my pairwise alignment, I can't really handle that. Um, but in general, because what I want to do is use these uh, this multiple sequence alignment for some downstream uh, evolutionary analyses, it turns out that those insertions with respect to the reference genome, because they're so rare, are typically unique. Like typically, individual sequences don't really share insertions with respect to the reference genome. So what tools usually do is just throw them out. Uh, and you don't lose very much information. So this limitation is actually not too bad. So yeah, so this has minimal impact on kind of those downstream results that we want. Uh, and in the future, if there ever ends up being some insertion that becomes especially interesting, um, so like with COVID, there's been a few insertions in the spike protein that are actually pretty interesting and important. What we can do is just change our reference genome to include those insertions. So any sequences that don't have those insertions are going to have deletions with respect to the reference genome. And anything that does have that insertion is going to have a match to the reference genome. So in general, all I'm kind of getting at is you can, you can adapt what you're doing um, you know, based on new information. Uh, yeah, Alejandra, I think you unmuted. Did you have a question? Oh, no. I just woke up. I'm sorry. I just oh, no, you're good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, cool. OK. So yeah, so, so this approach, it's much, 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 much faster. And it's actually quite accurate. And even the information that we lose is not super informative. So this approach, though, I want to emphasize, this has been around for a while. So this is not something that was a recent advancement. But I want to talk about something that I did last year that or was it two years ago? I don't remember. Uh, that you know is a little bit more novel. So this multiple sequence alignment problem, I want to just kind of step back and take another look at it. So the input is a reference genome and a bunch of really long sequences that are all super similar to the reference genome. And the output is some alignment of each of those sequences with respect to that reference genome. So does that general formulation sound familiar to anyone? Does that sound like anything we've talked about in the past? Basically, I have a bunch of sequences that are super, super, super similar to the reference genome. And I want to map each of them to the reference genome. I want to see how they match up to the reference genome. Does that sound like anything that we've talked about in the past weeks? Any thoughts? So we have a bunch of sequences that are almost identical to the reference genome. And we want to see where they best match up to the reference genome. No thoughts? Sounds completely new. So we discussed that on week two. So a, a little bit, um, but mainly, so is there anything from, so, so my question is, does this formulation that we have a reference genome and we have a bunch of sequences that are super similar to it, and my output is I want to see where each of those sequences matches up in that reference genome. And I'm, I'm asking, does this sound familiar to anything we've seen so far? And hint, you know, something that we talked about last week. Yeah, previous week. Yeah, so, so what did we talk about last week? That sounds kind of similar to this. So what was the, the computational problem we were solving last week? What was like the general gist of what we were doing, if anyone remembers? I remember like the comparison to see mm -hmm. um, when we compared like the three lines of genomes. Is that so, so there was the, the reads, right? Is that what you're getting at? I think. Yeah, so, so remember last week we talked about um, basically in the middle of the pandemic when I have all of those short sequences from these samples that I collect, like those reads that I sequence from a sequencing machine, we talked about how do we map those to the reference genome so that I can come up with a consensus sequence from those comparisons against the reference genome. So we talked about like read mapping 
as a computational problem last week. Does that kind of ring a bell to folks? Basically, we had a bunch of, that was how we improved genome assembly, right? We had a bunch of short sequences that we collected from a sample. And to be able to piece them together, yeah, the consensus sequence thing, to be able to piece them together, what we did was we took each of those short fragments and mapped them to the reference genome. And then the consensus sequence, we just kind of stepped through the reference genome and like basically took all the letters that overlap with any given position and output that as the consensus sequence. But that first step that given all of these short fragments that I've sequenced from my sequencing machine, mapping it to the reference genome, that's effectively the same exact computational problem we have here, right? The input was the reference genome and a bunch of sequences. They happen to be super short sequences versus here we have a bunch of long sequences, but still we had a reference genome and a bunch of sequences that were super, super, super similar to the reference genome. And the output was some mapping of each of those sequences to the reference genome. So the only difference between what I'm describing here and what we did last week was that, you know, the reads are just longer. So instead of having a hundred fragment chunk that's almost identical to the reference genome, I have what's effectively almost the entire genome or the entire genome length that's almost identical to the reference genome. So it's the same exact thing, except instead of dealing with sequences of length like a hundred that I'm trying to map, I have sequences of length 29,000 that I'm trying to map. But the computational problem is still the same. So it's the exact same computational problem as read mapping. It's just that the reads, quote unquote, are longer. So this is a tool that I developed, I think last year, where basically, remember last week, I talked about this read mapping problem is a super, super, super well-studied problem. People have been trying to speed this up for like decades. So the tools that exist in that space are really good. Like they're really, really, really efficient. So I wrote a tool that basically wraps around these existing really good read mappers to do this reference guided multiple sequence alignment kind of on its own. So there's a few read mappers that I wrap around to demonstrate flexibility. But remember last week, I talked about Minimap2 being my favorite. Um, so here's the GitHub repo. I can kind of show you a little bit later. And then we published a paper. I guess it was two years ago. Dang, time flies. Um, and then, yeah, like we published a paper. But basically, what this tool does, um, I can actually maybe show you. Um, let me first open up the code base. And the slides are posted on Canvas. So if you want to find this, you can look at the code base. Uh, it's just a single Python script. Um, and then I have some usage information, but let's just actually show an example. Let me pull up my terminal. I'm going to stop sharing real quick. Um, actually, let's do something even cooler. Let me see if I can get my hands on a big multiple sequence alignment. Um, I don't know. I'll just, I'll just do this one. Um, okay, let's see. So I'm going to go to my terminal. Can people see my, my terminal screen? Hopefully, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so basically, this tool, Viral MSA, that I built, uh, the usage is you tell it what are the sequences that you want to align. You tell it what is the reference genome that you want to use. Uh, and you have to give your email address, and details for that are kind of it's so that it can pull the reference genome from the internet. Uh, you specify the output directory, and then you can pick like which of these read mappers you want to use, specify number of threads, and then a couple other features that you don't have to worry about too much. Um, but yeah, so, so I have an example data set here of HIV sequences. So here's a few HIV genomes, right? And I can actually show you how many I have. Um, these commands that I'm using, don't worry about them. Uh, but if you ever take like some of the computer science courses, you can learn how to use the command line. So here I have a hundred HIV genomes. Um, and let me see how long they are. Um, and again, don't worry about what I'm doing here. So this is one of the genome sequences. Let me see how long it is. Uh, so each of these genomes is roughly a little over 9,000 letters long. So I have 
9,000 letters long and I have a hundred of them. So viral MSA, I specify what sequences I want to align. So that's my uh, example HIV sequences. Uh, I specify what's the output directory. So I'll just call it like temp for temporary. Um, I'll, I'll call it like HIV alignment. And then my email address, I have to add that so that it can pull the genome from this database. Whoops. Uh, and then the reference genome that I'm using, uh, these are HIV-1 sequences. So I'm going to use the HIV-1 reference genome. And it's done. <laughs> so it was like actually near instant. I think it took less than a second. Uh, so let's actually look at, um, where was it? Where did I where did I specify the output as by HIV alignment? So you'll notice it was able to put those gaps in, right, to line up the sequences properly. And it took like less than a second. Um, yeah, let me, let me pull up the paper too, so I can show you how it compares for COVID-19. Um, yeah, let me also, I'll post a link to it in the chat if people want to play around with it. Uh, okay. And then let me share my other screen. So here's from the paper that we published. I was measuring the runtime. So the vertical axis here, I think people can see my screen, I hope. Um, but yeah, so the vertical axis here is the runtime measured in seconds. And the horizontal axis here is the number of sequences. And these are complete COVID-19 genomes, so 29,000 letters long. And MAFT is that tool that I was describing that used to be kind of the best practice for this. And then Viral MSA, my tool, is over here. And as you'll see, it's like, like over a thousand, you know, even at a hundred, you know, even at a thousand sequences, this is like. I don't know, a few orders of magnitude faster, maybe like a thousand, ten thousand times faster. And that actually widens as the sequence, the number of sequences increases. Because remember, I said these heuristics scale quadratically versus my tool scales linearly. So they're actually going to widen as the number of sequences grows. 